Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Yancy. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And thank you, Elizabeth, and all the other organizers for the wonderful organization. So today, I'm going to talk about this uh, recent progress on the KOS conjecture. So in case uh, you don't know, actually, uh, uh, Boaz actually already gave a very wonderful uh, tutorial on this uh, paper about the KOS conjecture about two months ago. So uh, yeah, so if, uh, if you want all the details, you could go there or yeah, one option to give this presentation is since everything is online, I can just play the video on 2X mode. But yeah, the other action option will be that I, yeah, I will give a like a light uh, with uh, uh, presentation and hopefully you get uh, some more insights uh, uh, from uh, the presentation from an, a different guy. Uh, so uh, this talk will be divided by in, uh, three parts. I first uh, talk about the statement of the KOS conjecture and related problems. And then I'll explain in that details the main proof technique, uh, namely LDAN's stochastic localization scheme. And then finally, uh, if we have time, we might dive into like more details about the actually uh, the, the recent proof uh, we provided. Um, so let's say the KLS conjecture. Uh, so uh, the KLS conjecture is about uh, the isoparametric coefficient of a low concave density. So the isoparametric coefficient uh, of a density is the inf over all isoparametric coefficients of a subset. Well, for the subset, it's defined as a boundary measure divided by the, uh, the volume of uh, subset S. So you go through all the subsets of our dimension, D dimensional space, and you take the ratio of the boundary measure and the, the minimum of this volume S and S complement, you get the isoparametric coefficient. Okay. And then uh, the log concave density is defined as follows. Basically, you take the log, uh, and then this uh, is the usual concavity formula uh, definition. And this, uh, you don't take log in the definition because you want to include a very large class of uh, uh, concave density, which is uniform distribution over a convex set. But the usual kind of log concave densities like Gaussian exponential or logistic densities, they are all log concave because they can be written as a form uh, proportional to e to the minus f root f uh, convex function. So then I can state the Kanan, Lovas, Simon, Novich conjecture. Uh, they conjecture in 1995 that there exists a universal constant such that uh, for all log concave densities, the isoparametric coefficient is lower bounded by this constant times some normalization factor. Here, the normalization factor uh, is the uh, square root of the spectral norm of A. A is the covariance matrix of this uh, uh, density. Okay, so uh, if we only consider restrict ourselves to isotropic log concave density, mean that uh, the mean is zero variance is normalized to identity, then the lower bound is just saying that uh, the isoparametric coefficient is a universal constant. So the upper bound actually is uh, shown to be achieved in the achieved by half spaces in by by KOS in the 1995 paper. Uh, okay, so there are many. There are actually mainly two conjectures related to the KOS conjecture. Uh, the the thin shell conjecture stated in uh, uh, by Antilabo uh, and uh, Eric in 2003 that there exists a universal constant such that uh, the for any isotropic log concave density, the thin shell constant is of uh, is less than that constant. So. The thing show constant is basically the, the average deviation of the norm of the log concave random vector to the square root of d. So uh, if we consider isotropic log concave density, uh, this is the square root of d is basically the square root of the, um, the variance of this uh, log concave density. So it's right scaling. So basically saying that uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, average kind of deviation since the 
the other mass of uh, isotropic local cube density is around uh, this uh, thing show of radius constancy. And uh, actually for, for Gaussian density, it's easy to prove this type of uh, concentration inequality, but then this conjecture tried to say that for any isotropic local cube density, as long as uh, it's uh, variance is normalized, like the standard Gaussian, uh, this kind of behavior should be similar. Uh, so there's also more famous kind of conjecture, this uh, slicing conjecture stated by Bruggen in 1986. It states that uh, uh, there exists a universal constant that for any uniform distribution over a convex set, uh, you always have a hyperplane section that is uh, quite large. Uh, if, yeah, intuitively, kind of makes sense. You have a convex set, you cannot cut it uh, uh, and always have very small kind of volume in the cut. Uh, but it's actually quite hard to deal with this kind of conjecture. So there's also an equivalent form of this slicing conjecture stated by Bohr in 1988. Uh, it says that there exists a universal constancy such that for any isotropic log concave density, the slicing constant is less than C. Uh, the slicing constant here uh, for isotropic log concave density is a, has a very simple definition. It's just the, the density at zero raised to the power one over D. Um, okay, so this, uh, so this slicing constant uh, is a very useful uh, constant to, to derive actually concentration, the large deviation properties of uh, log concave random vectors. So this is a theorem by Baupis in 2006 uh, that actually um, the, the, the tail of a log, isotropic log concave density uh, is characterized by this uh, slicing constant L, LP. If you, uh, if you have this like slicing conjecture two LP is of order constant, then it's just saying that outside of this radius uh, constant times sphere D, then you have a subespecial um, exponential tail for isotropic log concave densities. Uh, okay, so the KLS conjecture actually uh, implies uh, the other two conjectures. So if we can prove uh, a lower bound on the KLS conjecture, we'll prove upper bounds for the other uh, two conjectures. So the following chain of inequality holds, uh, like the, take the soup over all isotropic log concave densities, then the inverse of the KLS constant is larger than the thing show constant is larger than the slicing constant. So the, the first part between the slicing constant and thing show constant uh, was proved uh, in Eldan and Flatark in 2011. And the second part is uh, actually from uh, Chigurh's inequality. And you can also look at like more general cases in uh, Milman 2009. Um, Okay, so if we prove, yeah, so the goal of this talk, we want to prove a lower bound of the KLS constant uh, psi p, and uh, if we prove a lower bound, we get the upper bound for both uh, the other two conjectures. Okay, so actually I, I come from more of this uh, statistics um, CMC sampling uh, background, and uh, we kind of want to understand the, the mixing time of MCMC sampling algorithms for like uh, the like posterior function density that arrive are from uh, Bayesian statistics, for example. And uh, the isoparametric constant is, uh, is a key quantity that arises in a lot of problems we study that usually the mixing time will be proportional to one over this isoparametric constant square. And that's why we are interested in like uh, how, like what is this constant in a high dimensional setting and of course, in like a lot of practical problems, the posterior density that arise that might be more complicated than log concave densities. But yeah, we kind of want to understand at least in the log concave setting as a primitive, like how the algorithms behave. And uh, for example, in like typical kind of two kind of implications for the mixing time bound for MCMC sampling is that we do study like the mixing time for sampling from a specific class of densities. And for example, if you take the smooth strongly 
log concave densities, meaning that the density is written as from e to the minus f with f uh, strongly con convex. And for sampling from uh, smooth uh, isotropic log concave densities where you just normalize the variance and the mixing time because of this thing that uh, uh, because of the chaos conjecture, uh, this will be like of the constant and the mixing time will be of similar order. Uh, it's kind of interesting for us, but uh, it's uh, uh, because like from kind of uh, like for a lot of people working in this field from coming from optimization kind of perspective uh, for optimizing strongly convex function, that is the analog of this uh, strongly log compare densities has a large gap between like optimizing strongly convex functions and optimizing some kind of normalized uh, weakly convex kind of functions. But here for sampling problems, seems like there's not much gap in terms of this dimension thing. Um, okay, and, and also another, another problem I worked on is that uh, in the case of uniform sampling from polytopes, actually uh, this will imply that in some high dimensional settings, you don't, need a very sophisticated um, CM sampling algorithms uh, to be the fastest, basically. Uh, so I explain more in details. So uh, uniform sampling on polytopes is uh, you have a polytope that is specified by a linear equation, AX less than B. Uh, a is a matrix of the dimension M times D. D is the dimension and M is the number of constraints. So in this example, you have a two dimensional polytope and the number of constraints is five. Uh, you want to sample points uniformly from this polytope because, uh, for example, you want to compute the volume of this convex set, or you want to basically uh, diversify your solution of the linear programming. So when you do linear programming, you get only one point. Sometimes you want more solutions on the, than just one point. So you want some kind of uniform sampling on this polytope. And actually, for, uh, the simplest uh, MCMC sampling algorithm you can think about is just a ball work. You, your proposal at each step is just a, a ball or a standard Gaussian distribution. And then you use the metropolis thing. Uh, then, then you use the metropolis thing accept reject step to correct so that it is always inside the, the, the polytope and it has the correct stationary distribution. And so the for ball work, the mixing time uh, is uh, is uh, basically uh, d square over uh, the iso uh, the the, the isoparametric coefficient square if the density happens to be some in some isotropic position. Uh, this is proved in 1997 paper. And the per iteration cost of the ball work is the smallest. Uh, because at each iteration, you just need to check this linear system to do the accept reject step. Uh, like, yeah, then people do invent like more and more kind of complicated algorithms. Here, at least some algorithms, basically the idea comes from the uh, interior point optimization uh, kind of algorithms where they have a kind of, they use a polytope to build a barrier so that the, uh, your algorithm, the proposal, at each step is no longer just a ball or a standard Gaussian, but some kind of ellipsoid. So basically the idea is that you want the algorithm, the proposal to adapt to the, to the local geometry of this uh, polytope. For example, if you are in some very sharp corner, you no longer want to propose uh, like a, a ball. You want somehow the, the ellipsoid to go more in the, in the corner direction than the other direction. Now, for example, you're close to the edge, uh, you don't want a ball, but probably an elongated lip, at least so it will be better. So this kind of intuition are implemented. Uh, this type of algorithm, Dicking work or John work or weighted Dicking work, uh, their pre-intuition cost is higher because to get those ellipsoid at each iteration, you want to have, uh, you'd want to solve a linear system instead of just checking a linear system. So here at least the, the, the cost of solving a linear system. And eventually the, the, the mixing time of this kind of best algorithm, John Walker weighted Dicking work will get to D square. Uh, but you should think about this special case in high dimensional you know, uh, polytopes, which is in the, some isotropic position where it's, so it's a uh, variance in normalized identity. And then KOS conjecture is also true. Then it just means that 
if you multiply this, if you multiply this second column with third column, it just means that wall work is the best uh, kind of algorithm in this kind of scenario. Uh, means that in high dimensional polytope in the isotropic position, you don't need your MCMC sampling algorithm to adapt to the local geometry proposal to be standard Gaussian is kind of enough to be fast. Um, uh, which is kind of interesting uh, phenomenon. And so now let's talk about how we prove the KLS conjecture. There are many attempts uh, um, to prove the KLS conjecture. And so the, 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 the KLS conjecture is uh, related to thin shell conjecture. I forgot to mention, but I mentioned it again. So uh, actually the thin shell constant can imply the chaos conjecture as well. We explained that chaos constant implies thin shell constant by Archegas inequality, but the reverse direction is uh, not very, it's not trivial, but can, can also be proved. So Bob, Bob in 2007 proved that uh, the relationship will have a D to the one fourth gap via some uh, stock, uh, via some localization scheme. And Eldan in 2007, uh, 2013 proved that uh, via stochastic localization that uh, actually the thin shell con conjecture is equivalent to the KLS conjecture up to some log D factors. So uh, all the previous bonds on the thin shell conjecture can be used uh, to state a bond for the KLS conjecture. And you can see that the, 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 the dimension dependency about the thin shell constant uh, gets lower and lower in, in the past few years. Uh, okay, so then uh, actually we'll be focusing mainly on uh, the proofs that directly attack the KLS conjecture. So actually in the 19, sorry, 1995, 1995 and 1993 paper, they use this, uh, KLS used this uh, localization uh, lemma to prove that uh, the dimension dependency will be d to the one half. And in 2017, uh, Vian Van Pala used the uh, LDAN's stochastic localization scheme to show that it's uh, uh, d to the one fourth. And uh, in our recent paper, we show still by our LDAN's stochastic localization scheme that uh, uh, the dimension dependency can be as low as uh, d to the log log d over log d to the one half. So this, this uh, exponent tends to zero when d tends to infinity. So if you ignore the, the, the constant, this is uh, better than d to the alpha with any fixed alpha rate, or it's uh, slightly worse than the log d rate, but uh, it's an almost constant kind of uh, uh, Prove of the KLS constant. So um, next, let's talk about this uh, um, Eldan stochastic localization, the main proof technique uh, we use in our proof. Uh, the high-level strategy is kind of similar in this uh, all this localization-based technique. Uh, you want to prove this high-dimensional isoparametric inequality, but you don't prove it uh, directly you will modify the density with some iterative procedure. And you uh, hopefully the modified density, you can easily get uh, an idle parametric inequality. Uh, and then uh, you prove an uh, idle parametric inequality on the modified density, then you have to bring it back to the original density to prove the original density. And how do we modify the density? So it's, in the, in, in the original KLS uh, paper, we can think about this localization lemma. Uh, it's kind of iterative reduced original problem to a lower dimensional problem. And we in the, in the final, they just uh, have a proof for the one dimensional uh, isoparametric inequality, and then they prove the high dimensional um, isoparametric inequality. So this idea of needle decomposition actually goes to the uh, 1960s, I think. People try to prove uh, Ponga inequality. I forgot to prove, put the citation here. But, uh, yeah. Uh, so then in Eldan stochastic localization, a uh, sure similar idea, but it's kind of more, you can think about it as a more advanced way of modifying the density or more advanced uh, procedure. Um, okay, so uh, actually here to give some more intuition or like make it easier to understand, I actually copied some slides from uh, early slides, Elden 
presented when he presented his cell the stochastic globalization. So uh, the idea, uh, yeah. So the idea is that uh, you can modify the density by uh, by random by random cuts. So uh, the, if you like always cut the density into half, and you will end up with something like smaller and smaller. And hopefully, like yeah, the the high dimensional inequality you want to prove, you can end up with some something like very low dimensional thing to prove or easy thing to prove. It's not trivial, but uh, that's kind of one attempt that you can use a random cut to to cut the density. So you start with the uniform density on a uh, convex set K, and you find a random direction uniformly on the sphere. Then you take a half of it k1 so the k1 will be uh, roughly the the volume of k1 will be half of k and then you can do it iteratively again with the second cut and the volume of k2 well, well actually you get smaller and smaller volume thing and you hopefully you can get something useful but uh, so one property they can prove is actually this uh, if you have an initial set of volume one half then the volume ratio is always uh, concentrated around one half. This is kind of useful property because uh, saying that when you do this kind of modification of the uh, density, you always keep uh, this part constant or at least right, this part. But the other part, how about the other parts? Uh, do we have good control of the other parts? Uh, it's not very clear yet. Um, so then actually he tried something else. So the other, the second, way actually you think about to modify the density is to actually multiply by a small random function. So you start with this uh, uniform distribution over this convex set K and you find a random direction theta one. You don't just truncate the density and take the, this uh, right half, but you multiply this uh, density F zero by one plus epsilon X one transpose theta one. So uh, the mass on the right hand side will increase a little bit, mass on the left side will de decrease. So this is how you modify the density. And then you can do it again with a second random cut theta two. And then you can see in the picture here, the uh, mass on the right hand side get more and this get less. So this, yeah, you, you have a smooth way basically to, uh, to modify your density. Uh, so compared to, the, six, the first attempt, you, you don't keep the volume ratio, you don't keep the quantity on the right hand side of the idle parametric inequality constant, but you do have some advantages. Epsilon, uh, you, you, you multiply by something very small and you can make this process continue, so we'll see. And uh, by, by letting epsilon get to zero, 10 to zero. So, and also it actually makes appear a Gaussian part in the density when you do this, uh, uh, modification of the density. So imagine you just lucky that uh, you multiply the, the two random direction happen to be up in the opposite direction and it's X1 and the minus X1. So you might multiply by one plus epsilon X1 and one minus the epsilon X1. It is roughly one minus epsilon square X1 square and it's roughly exponential minus epsilon square X square. So basically, uh, you are multiplying, if you are lucky this way, you are multiply your density by minus epsilon square x1 square. So you make up here a little uh, quadratic part in the exponent of your density. And that's how you make up, uh, uh, so you can actually make up a Gaussian part in your density. And uh, the idea is that if you kind of make up enough Gaussian part in the density, then it's very easy to prove uh, an isoparametric inequality. Uh, so how exactly it does this and like, how do you make this the process uh, easy to, to deal with? So uh, the, the exact way is, is via this stochastic differential equation might look complicated, but uh, if you look at the, how the density is uh, changing on the left, right, uh, on the left bottom corner here, is that basically you are multiply your original density P by some um, um, quadratic uh, e to the so Gaussian part e to the minus quadratic part. And uh, the covariance part, the dt, 
is just uh, linearly increasing. Think about CT as the identity for now. Uh, we will deal with that later. So CT is identity, BT is just linear increasing. So the Gaussian part is linear increasing and the intercept part, uh, the, the first order part, basically you have uh, a marking go part and uh, you have uh, a gift part. So the uh, so this part is kind of most uh, uh, complicated part, but it's actually uh, the, 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 the most interesting part in this kind of transformation. You multiply by this and you normalize, you get a density, okay? So what's the relationship with uh, that second attempt we showed like two slides ago? Uh, you can show that actually, if you write down this density PTX and for any fixed X, you can take the derivative and you can show that uh, the, the change for any fixed X, the change of the density is just uh, uh, the multiplying your density by a small linear function. So it's uh, X minus mu T transpose uh, identity and the DWT. DWT here is the Brownian motion, sorry if I missed it. Uh, so basically the, 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 the version of when you let epsilon tend to zero is you make yeah, you have this uh, Brownian motion is serving as a random direction and you multiply your uh, x. So if x transpose the random direction multiplied to the function, that is, your, that is your density change. And it's basically like this kind of change when epsilon 10 to zero, okay? Um, okay, let me show you a quick simulation. Um, for the case that uh, dimension equals two, a equals two, I cannot do it for high dimension, but hopefully get the idea in the two dimensional case. So we start with a uniform distribution over uh, sim uh, our, uh, a simplex in two dimension. Right? And then we run this stochastic uh, uh, differential equation. So it will modify the density. So let me run. So it modified the density and uh, on the left will be like one, one random seed, a starting seed and one on the right, uh, another starting seed. So it's a stochastic differential equation. So we don't have full control, but we can see like it when it is run from different random seed, what is common is you always have a Gaussian part that appear in your density as becoming a larger and larger Gaussian part. But the location, the exact location of the Gaussian is actually not clear. It's not, it's not, not clear. It can be anywhere uh, because it's a random stochastic differential equation. And we only have control of those things uh, in expectation. Um, okay. So let's go back to um, the slide. So hopefully you get some intuition about this stochastic globalization. And how do we use it uh, to prove uh, uh, an isoparametric inequality? So here comes the slide actually uh, that explains, uh, summarize the, 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 the other proofs that use the stochastic globalization to prove the isoparametric inequality. So you want to prove is that the, the boundary measure is larger than some constant times the minimum of the volume of S and S complement. Right, that is your goal, the first line and the last line. Uh, you don't prove it directly. So you first transform your density P to PT. Uh, and then you use the Martin Gold property. We just prove that the, the boundary measure of PT is equals to boundary measure of P in the expectation. And because at time T, you make appear some Gaussian parts of this BT, it's basically the, the quadratic term you add uh, to the exponent of the density. So you make up here a Gaussian part in your density at time t, and the density becomes uh, strongly log concave. For strongly log concave density, we can easily prove isoparametric inequality, for example, via the original KOS uh, localization lemma, and the isoparametric coefficient will be related to how strong that Gaussian part is. And you get this uh, part. And then what you need to do is just to relate this uh, PTS back to the original PS volume PS, right? So if you start with a uh, density with measure one half, you just need to show that this PTS always stay 
close to the uh, one half. Uh, we show it, it's with high probability. <laughs> the probability, uh, it stays in one fourth and three fourths of order constant. So uh, basically, uh, when you do this like stochastic localization, uh, what you get uh, in terms of uh, isoparametric inequality will be uh, uh, isoparametric co co constant will be some some the, the amount of Gaussian you make appear and the probability that you can keep this uh, uh, density PT as the the volume uh, around one half. Okay, so uh, starting with some geometric problem, but uh, the proof actually because of this application of this l dense stochastic localization, uh, the proof is actually pretty uh, an analysis problem. You want to start this stochastic differential equation and you have control of the, uh, the BT and the, 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 the volume of PTS, okay? Um, let's see, so if we choose the CTS identity, then automatically BT is always increasing. So like in our simulation, you have this Gaussian part increase uh, uh, linearly, it's, uh, it's the, the longer you can run the stochastic differential equation, the larger the Gaussian part you add to the density. Okay, that is clear. And then for the PTS, uh, the, the volume of the, the density S, you can take the derivative and you can see that uh, basically when you take the derivative in this uh, stochastic localization scheme, uh, it's like a moment generator you make up here. So you start with something like integral over S of PT, you make up here uh, a linear part or you take one derivative. And when you look at its quadratic variation, you can see that this, uh, the change of this uh, volume PTS is um, related to the uh, spectral norm of the uh, covariance matrix at, at time t. So that's why actually a lot of like the Lee and Pala in our proof has a huge part focus on focusing on controlling the covariance matrix AT uh, uh, of, yeah. Okay, so the covariance matrix, you can take the derivative. Uh, it has some Martin Gold part and has some drift part. We want to control a spectral norm and it's typically via this potential function, you raise this uh, uh, matrix AT to the power Q and then you take the trace. And if you take the power one over Q and you get back an upper bound for the spectral norm. Okay, so Liam and Paula actually in, in their proof they provided in 2017, they, they use Q equals two and CTA post identity. And let's briefly take a look at their proof. Uh, so their potential function, you only raise it to power two and you can see when you take the derivative, you have the usual Martin part and you have a negative part, but you also make up here some uh, uh, third order tensor part which is actually a difficult part uh, in their in their proof, and uh, they 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 have some good ways to bond this potential, and they have end up with a stochastic differential equation for the uh, for the potential function, and you solve the this stochastic differential equation, and they they can show that it, until time one over d to the one half, you have a, a control of the spectral norm, and now we can see, we can go back to the way we prove the L-dense stochastic localization. So you can run the, if you can run the stochastic localization to time one over D to the one half, your quadratic part will exactly be that large. So this uh, BT to the one half will be D to the minus one fourth. And then they show also this, they control this uh, spectral norm and then control this PT as the volume of PT. So this will offer other one. So that's how they get uh, uh, iso for isoparametric. So iso for isotropic log concave density, the isoparametric coefficient is lower bounded by d to the one over d to the one fourth. Okay, so the natural idea is to take a larger Q because intuitively, if you have a larger Q in the potential function, you get a, you get a better, uh, approximation of the spectral norm, but uh, if you take the derivative of this uh, potential function, you will see that uh, you have like annoying third order terms, third order tensors that appear, it's, it was not easy to control. So then um, our 
main contribution will be lying in control this uh, third order like tensors that appear in the derivative of the potential function. Um, so yeah, we want to prove an almost constant bond better than this uh, Demon Parla 2017. Um, the main technical improvement is that we have uh, a backward control of the potential function uh, in two stages, I will explain. And then we actually uh, bootstrap the same scheme with larger and larger Q iteratively. Um, like shown in this lemma. So if we know the R, if we know the isoparameter coefficient is lower bounded uh, by something d to the power beta. So that's something we start with from, for example, the local KLS localization lemma. And using our proof, you can improve that d to the beta to d to the beta minus beta over 8q, with q taken as the one over beta. So roughly you improve. Uh, from d to the beta to d to the beta minus beta square. And that's, you can see that how we improve the exponent and we eventually get rid of this. Uh, uh, this, this thing can be 10, like well, 10 to zero if you uh, run an induction. So uh, the main step is uh, trying to control this potential in two schemes. So, when you take the derivative of this gamma, you have some Martin Gold part, you have this third other term part is the most important. And you have some negative part we ignored here. So the Martin Gold part and the negative part from now on, we will ignore them. But the third other tensor part we will focus them here. And you can write the potential derivative as, the, as this form. Uh, you have uh, X transpose Y, X transpose Y, X transpose Y, but with matrix X, M1, M2, M3, but here it's just uh, AT to the power Q minus one here. And, and, and here. And the, the goal here is to basically to control this um, potential function. If you can control this potential function, and if you want, can control this, uh, uh, you can control the spectral norm to less one over T, and then uh, your integral of the spectral norm will be of other constant. Then you control basically the PTS of other constant. And then you can control, you can conclude that the isoparameter coefficient will be other d to the one, uh, t to the one half. So the longer you can run this uh, stochastic differential equation with the control of this potential function, uh, the better isoparameter inequality you get. Okay, so how can we run it? Uh, longer and still have control. So uh, the, the, the main idea to bond this uh, three tensor or like three, yeah, we call it three tensor. Uh, we want bond everything in terms of the second moment because this gamma t is something, a function of the uh, at. And we want bond everything in terms of function of at, right? But we don't want the third order terms x, x, x appear. Uh, so, the main idea is just yeah to apply Ponga high inequality that will allow you to shave uh, one uh, exponent. So instead of getting third moment, you will get uh, have control of everything in terms of second moment. So uh, the Ponga high inequality, uh, the Ponga high constant is uh, implied by the KOS constant. So this kind of uh, illustrates this kind of bootstrap kind of scheme. So you have some KOS constant. Yeah, you, you control the Pongai constant by Chigas inequality. And you have a Pongai constant, you can control this other third order tensor term in the stochastic localization lemma, and you get a better KOS constant. Okay. And the, the, the key thing I'm going to explain here is the, is the thing the, the control the potential in two stages. Uh, in the first stage, actually, you start with something. Uh, uh, like just log concave density, you don't know any kind of uh, Gaussian part that is being added. So you will just apply the Ponga inequality with a non isoparametric constant and you get a bound for the potential function. And in the second stage, actually you have, you know that you now add the Gaussian part and, uh, and you can apply Ponga inequality with the added Gaussian and you get a better control of the third order tensor it was not trivial to prove it, but we have some small tricks to, to prove this kind of inequality. 
And if you can prove this uh, two kind of two stage control of the potential function, you will see that in the, in the first stage, uh, so if you start with some isoparameter coefficient with order d to the minus beta, in the first stage, you can only run it to the time d to the minus two beta. And as we have seen that, if you can only run it to the d to the minus two beta, you can only show a as a parameter coefficient of order due to the minus beta. So you don't improve anything if you only have the first stage of the uh, control. So, so actually, so the first stage is already known for, I think for many years. So, and that's why uh, people don't think that this way is the kind of, you can improve the as a parameter coefficient via this stochastic localization lemma. So the second stage actually is new. We have a better way to control the potential and you can show that you can run the stochastic localization for a longer time, that how much longer you can run is exactly of order d to the beta square, q is taking as one of order one over q. So you can see that if you can, you can run it for uh, a little bit longer time and you get a better isoparametric uh, coefficient. And if you do this uh, many times, you keep improving the isoparametric uh, coefficient. Um, okay, that will conclude my talk. So I just, yeah, so it takes, it takes away. So uh, the Adam stochastic localization scheme is like, it's a very powerful proof technique actually to, to reduce the high dimensional other parameter inequality to some, something you're familiar with. So we have not fully explored the, the, the Adam stochastic localization scheme. There are many like different ways to tune it, like to tune the, the the control matrix CT, we have taken it in the as identity in our in this talk, but there are actually uh, different ideas. So, but we have uh, I don't know how to actually control uh, 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 how how to make use of it. Maybe there's actually a better way to choose those things uh, parameters, and we get a better bond. Uh, um, I don't know, uh, but thank you.